that I have up here is of a minaret. And the reason that I put up the minaret there was this minaret was built in the 1650s by uh, the emperor who built the, the Taj Mahal, which I guess most people would know. This is a minaret in the old city of Delhi, it's in the Jama Masjid. The interesting thing, of course, is, I mean, the minaret itself is beautiful, is, is the stuff that's happening behind. Uh, the stuff that Shah Jahan had never conceived of. Because at that point of time, this was the great world city. This was like, uh, you know, Berlin or uh, Venice or whatever it is at that point of time. But it was a wonderfully planned city, the new city that was built. But uh, as per the law of unintended consequences, it's turned into a very interesting place, which is both chaotic and sort of dramatic in, in the background. So sometimes where we are in history, uh, you know, we have to look both back and forward to get a sense of, of what the world might be like and how it might be changing. So I'll, I'll take you through a quick run, run of where things are. So if I turn around from where the minaret, if I was to run around in the minaret and look somewhere else, this is, this is the image that you'd see here. This is an image of what we call the Red Fort. This is a place where our Prime Minister on the 15th of August every year addresses the nation. But there's some very interesting elements in this image here. And some people think it's Photoshop, but it's not. This is actually a real image here. There are three elements. There's the red in the front, which was a fort that was built by, by Shah Jahan in, in the mid-1600s. Um, so that's sort of India's post-colonial history. And then somewhere in between, my cursor probably, yeah, here it is. This is actually a heritage building. Uh, it's a heritage building because it's more than 100 years old by Indian law, but it's actually built by the British. Okay, so the British came and they lived in India for a long time. So that is, in a sense, our colonial history that you see there. Uh, and it can't be taken down, even though it might be a sort of travesty to certain Indian nationalists, but it's, it's part of our history. And then, of course, you have post-colonial India here in the background. That's our new metro, one of our new metro uh, stations and, a, you know, a metro IT park which is sitting on the back. So, uh, and there's some new housing and, and, uh, behind there. And then finally, there's something that you cannot see at all, and that's, I think, the fundamental challenge that we have in our country. And that is we, we had, at a point of time, 100,000 people who are living in the river bank, which you can't see there. So the challenge of contemporary India is really, uh, in, in real life situations, we have to span four or 500 years, and these are all living cultures. The cultures of the pre-colonial, the old city of Delhi, if you go there, you should always spend some time and understand what's happening. The colonial legacy that we, we have, in fact, the Indian state is, is still very, very strongly influenced by the colonial experience. The modern, which Hock Larsen and other people from across the world brought to India, and it, you know, India built it into a different, in a different future, and the informal. Uh, and of course, the big challenge that we have is uh, most of our people still, and we have the largest number of poor people in the world, live in that informal environment. So bringing the four together is our fundamental challenge, something that many other parts of, of, of the world don't actually uh, have to engage with. But then, this is situated, uh, as we heard just briefly, in a rapidly globalizing world. Now, this is not the first wave of globalization. This might be the third or the fourth, depending to what sort of school of history you're talking about, but it's, it's, it's a wave that we're living in and, and, a, and a wave that's actually changing not only us and our cultures, but the world. So what is that bounded by? Uh, I can say this now because Neil Armstrong, you know, he died a few, few weeks back. Uh, the fundamental thing that connects all of us, and that's where the whole story of co-creation comes, is, as far as we know, and some science fiction people and some scientists might, might suggest otherwise, there is only one Earth. And it is really in a small corner of the known universe. That is really what, what actually binds us together. That's what sort of ties us together. And this is the reason why, historically and certainly in the 21st century, co-creation is the only way forward. Um, but then there are some very interesting challenges. Uh, at the current point of time, the consumption that we have, and this is true especially of OECD countries and, you know, certainly the United States, if we continue to consume the amount of resources that we have at the moment, uh, we have a bit of a problem, okay? We are consuming an awful lot more than the world can, can deal with. And of course, our population is growing, but at seven billion, we might go to maybe something like nine, possibly 10, depending on what's happening. And then if you look at India's most significant challenge, ending poverty, that will also require a lot of resources because the kind of situation that a lot, lot of people are living in the world, especially in our part of the world, is very significant. So if you add all of this together, the two plus 1.5 and, uh, and the two, you have five and a half worlds. And that, that unfortunately, is a little unsustainable. So the, the real fundamental challenge of the 21st century is we only have one world. <clears throat> and we have to make this transition in less than 100 years. And if we don't make that transition, and you know, you're very close to the poles, you'll really experience it faster than we will. 
um, there are a lot of challenges that are going to be faced with us. And this travers, fortunately, unfortunately, and I'll be very concrete and very direct here, will be played out in two places. And this sounds, sounds interesting and, you know, what does something in Copenhagen have to do with what's happening in an Indian city or a Chinese city? But basically, this will be played out, and you can see that in the global economy today, it'll be played out in what happens in Indian and Chinese cities, because the predominant momentum of both growth and consumption is actually emerging in, in the global south. So, 